Oh, hello, it's Sandy here. Hope you're well. Um, I'm well, I'm happy to say. Um, I feel a, 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 a touch weak. However, apart from that, I'm pretty strong today. How are you? And um, before I go on to read more from the Marks and Sparks book, I'd like to show you what I'm wearing, if I may, and I shall give myself the permission to show you. So today I'm not wearing makeup. It's a nice Sunday today. I was just about to stay in my pajamas all day and then I changed my mind. So I just have a very plain pastel colored headband and as I said, no makeup and my superb pastel colored. It's a dress actually, but I'm wearing it as a top. Then I have my lovely pastel colored leggings. And at the bottom, I think this pair of socks is quite an, are quite interesting. I'm just trying to show you as, as best I can. Um, what's taking place with this that's better there we are they're my socks they actually can go much higher but um wh whatever i think you've got an idea i hope so of what they look like oh gosh so sorry i'm um just going to start now and before I on a change of mind basis before I begin I'm just going to drink some water it may be the heat that's provoking me to feel a little bit on the weak side bear with me please Yes, I do feel somewhat better. So, thank you for being patient. Now I'm going to start reading from the Marks and Sparks book to you. And before I do so, please look at the picture that is on the other side of what I'm going to read you. There we are, Marks and Spencers. Isn't that just superb picture? I think so. I'm really excited on subject of my project I'm doing right now. How to Grow. Marks and Spencer Limited, registered offices, Derby Street, Ch Chetham, Manchester. In the first post-war year, 1919, M&S turnover was £550,000. Near 20 years later, I'll start again on that one, 20 years later, in 1939, it was £23,448,000. In that year, there were 234 stores and over 17,000 employees. In 1924, the head office of the company had been transferred from Manchester to Friendly House 21 to 23, Chis Chisel Street, London, EC1. Or it may be described Chiswell Street, London, EC1. Spelling for Chisel or Chiswell. C in a capital, H-I-S-W-E-L-L. New premises also in Street London, EC1. No, sorry, start that part again. New premises also in Chisel Street, or Chiswell Street, were acquired and rebuilt at Michael House. Uh, as, sorry, I'm very sorry, also, also in Chisel or Chiswell Street, 
were acquired and rebuilt as Michael House at a cost of £29,000 and were opened in 1928. And in 1931, Michael House moved to 72 to 82 Baker Street. M&S was now a nationwide organisation with branches in London, the rest of England, Scotland and Wales, and when war broke out in 1939, plans were ready for the construction of a new central office building. During these interwar years, when the numbers of small retailers were falling and when multiple stores and department stores were increasing in size and in share of the market, the M&S store, looking very different from the old Penny Bazaar, became a major feature of the local scene in all of England's larger shopping centres. It was sometimes next to and often opposite Woolworths and its main neighbours, it, it usually had multiple shop branches, many of them newly established companies with very mixed fortunes. One thing that Woolworths and M&S had in common, and they were both successes, was that they positively welcomed people going inside and if they did not buy, even if they did not buy. Mm. Now that's a good one because in most of the time when, when I go shopping, if I'm not interested in what I'm in the shop and I'm not interested in anything, I notice I start to be not talk spoken to, in that, so so to speak. So that's good, you see, I, I like, marks and sparks because I think the staff are trained work correctly in my opinion so um, I've lost my place now even if they did not buy the moment you go into an English shop Frank Woolworth had written after this his first visit to Europe in 1900 you are expected to buy, it's what I just said, and to have made your choice from the window. They give you an icy stare if you follow the American custom of just going to look around. Absolutely so correct. There were no icy stares in either Woolworths or m and and although the two stores were to follow quite different patterns of development, they were alike too in their desire to make their premises tempting. Indeed, H. Pasmargen, in his valuable The Department Store, Its Origin Evolution of Economics, 1954, pointed out how during the 1920s and 1930s, M&S gave rise to an entirely new form of business, located halfway between the unit price store and the department store and which, penetrating deeply into the assortment of department stores, made inroads upon their trade. Prices still mattered to M&S customers, but as was pointed out in one of the surprisingly few books on retailing published at the time, Dorothy Braithwaite and S.P. Dobbs, Distribution of Consumable Goods, 1932, palatial premises, numerous and well-trained shop assistants, a large choice of goods and similar articles attract the public more successfully than would a slight price difference. It was not just that large-scale retailing was supplanting, though not destroying, small-scale retailing. Shops like cinemas were part of a new urban landscape. And the very place of retailing in society was changing too. At the end of the First World War, 10% of Britain's workers were employed in the distribu distributive trades. On the outbreak of the Second World War, the figure was 13%. This was not just replacement, it was growth. Excuse me, distributive, I think. Distributive. I think it's distributive, so I'll go on. It would not have been easy to forecast the scale of this development immediately after, immediately after the First World War. 
Indeed, in 1921, 1922 and 1923, problems at MS loomed as large as opportunities. One of the most serious of them was business loss at a number of old, well-established MS centres. It was decided in consequence in June 1923, for instance, to close down Bolton, Cardiff and Wakefield market stores. The other serious problems were finding finance for new development and replanning merchandising policy. In 1919, the company had acquired 13 freehold store properties and in 1920 another 11. But many of these are mortgaged from the start and there were worrying bank overdrafts. As for merchandising, how could MS develop logically and consistently in the future given that, that the penny limit set before the war could no longer work? We continued to sell goods at a wide range of prices, Simon Marks wrote later, which presented a confusing picture to the customer and I came to the conclusion that a simpler price structure was essential. Problems were transformed into opportunities after M&S was converted into a public company in 1926. Indeed, two years before that, Simon Marks had begun to find answers both to the financial problem and to the retailing problem when he visited the United States, the first of many visits across the Atlantic. He has described vividly and succinctly, in his own brief account of MS history, thank you, Oreo, what happened as a result of his American visit. Having assumed control of the private company, I was free to face up to its problems. Woolworths had been making extraordinary progress and were rapidly developing throughout the country. They had become a household word, a great commercial institution. We had marked time and could report no change since the days of my father, other than a, new, a few more branches. I was conscious of my own shortcomings and ignorance. I had never worked in the shop. I had no training in the business other than that which I was to acquire by trial and error. I felt that somehow I had to expand my experience, learn from other people how to face up to the competition from this commercial giant whose red signs were beginning to dominate the main shopping streets of Great Britain. Okay, so I shall show you um, the pictures um, from where I was reading. There's the first page. And I read a little bit from this page as well. So I'll show you the picture if I may. Okay, so um, that's the uh, reading and my throat is very croaky and dry from that. Thank you for your patience again. I didn't say excuse me, did I? Sorry. So, I just so wish to show you some photographs of myself when I was considerably younger, to say the least, and slimmer and a uh, dancer. So, here's one picture of me dancing in my garden in Stanmore, when I lived in Stanmore with my parents, I think. Uh, that's a picture of me maybe about 20 years, five years ago, perhaps. And this one is of me when I was younger. I'm doing it in the incorrect order, however, never mind. Yes, I was doing gymnastics, obviously, in that picture. Oh, well, it's obvious to me anyway. Um, and I was even slimmer then when I was about, I was about maybe, maybe 12, 13, 14, something to that effect, I think. And uh, very nice and slender. I'm jealous of what I used to look like.
<laughs> and then there's the last picture, which I may have shown you before. I'm not sure. But that's of me. And that's of me um, dancing ballet at the age of about 10, 12. Got a little Oreo meowing. Yes, darling. I'm coming to your attention. I'm just about to close off the vlog, sweetie. So, I thank you so much for watching. Um, just to say one more point, I've noticed, noticed as I read more and more, I'm building more and more self-confidence and I'm getting better at it. I don't mind saying that's really pleased. I'm really pleased with myself. And it's good practice for me and I hope it's interesting for you. Um, so to my late father, and particularly to my late grandfather's legacy, thank you, Papa, for giving me um, the pride and glory of your achievements and your achievement. I love you, Papa. Take care, please, everyone. And please take care of each other and look after yourselves again. Take care, please. Bye.